So good evening, everyone, and welcome to our community conversation on healthcare. We're excited to have the opportunity to share with you some of the exciting things that are happening in healthcare, both in this community and throughout the province. My name is Nancy McConnell Maxner. I work with Nova Scotia Health, and I will be moderating this evening. And I hope you had an opportunity to kind of go around the tables and uh, ask some questions and get some information. Maybe uh, sign up for Virtual Care Nova Scotia if you had the opportunity. Um, I did want to just uh, mention that for the rest of this uh, evening will be recorded. And that's for people that are unable to join us tonight or if you want to go back and rewatch it, you can do that. It will be posted on the same site that uh, you registered on. So in terms of the format for tonight, we will be doing uh, a comments from our leadership panel and followed by a question and answer period. For the question and answer period, I'll be looking around the room to see, uh, take questions from the audience. We have people with mics, so you do not have to get up to, to go to a microphone. Someone will bring it to you. We do ask that if you're asking a question, um, and someone else has already asked the question, that you write it on a card if it's a similar question. Especially with a lot of people, we wanna make sure we can get to as many topics as we possibly can. And so if you have a question that's very specific to you in a situation that you've been in, please talk to one of the team after and, sh and share the experience that you need to share, get your contact information and someone will follow up with you. So we're just trying to make things run as smoothly as possible. We're really excited about hearing from you and you'll hear from the leadership around how that will work. So now, I would like to call on the Honorable Jill Balser, the Minister of Labor, Skills and Immigration and the M uh, MLA for Digby, Annapolis to say some welcoming remarks, thanks. can say this because my mom's here I can take after her so <laughs> so of course everyone knows me and thank you for all all of you for being here today so thanks Nancy and welcome everyone so I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kmaq the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people I also want to acknowledge that people of African descent have helped shape the history and culture of Nova Scotia for more than 400 years and we also know that this is a very special area and home to the four founding cultures. So we also want to recognize the Acadians in this community as well. So I am so pleased to be here and part of this evening's conversation with all of you and have some of our health leaders here in Digby this evening. These are some very important discussions that we are going to have. So I'm very pleased to welcome my colleague, Health and Wellness Minister, Michelle Thompson. The Nova Scotia, well, yes, you can clap. <laughs> And the Nova Scotia Interim CEO, Karen Oldfield. Yes, <laughs> they can clap for you too, Karen. <laughs> they will be providing an update on the work underway to improve the healthcare system and of course answer the questions that you have. Health and Wellness Deputy Minister Janine Lagasse is also here with us to help address any questions that you have. Yes, give her a round of applause as well. So with that, I just want to say thank you, and I'm looking very forward to the discussion that we're going to have this evening. And so now I will pass it off to Mr. Thompson to make a few remarks. Thanks, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Um, can you hear me okay at the back? Yeah. So before we start, I'd just like to also acknowledge our colleague, Ronnie LeBlanc, who's here. He's the MLA for Claire. And uh, I want to thank Ronnie. You just maybe put your hand up. There we go. There he is. So we want to acknowledge uh, our colleague. <laughs> Yeah, so, so thanks everyone for having us. I'm really grateful to be here. Uh, we are on a bit of a tour across the province. We have 18 stops. Uh, I think this is 13. 13. Yeah, lucky number. I heard someone say in the, uh, that's our lucky number. Yeah, so I'm just going to start briefly to tell you. Uh, so we were elected on a platform to uh, fix health care. Certainly the platform that we ran on resonated with Nova Scotians and we started very early, uh, the day after we formed government. Uh, for the first time, we now have a leadership team that actually has Nova Scotia Health and Department of Health and Wellness for the very first time sitting at a table on a weekly basis, making decisions from a system perspective. Prior to that, they would have been very separate entities and run parallel. And so information didn't always uh, cross over in a way that, that maybe it could have or should have. 
So this new leadership team meets on a weekly basis. It, basis. it consists of Janine and Karen. It also consists of Janet Davidson, who's really a, a, a thought leader in healthcare in our country and in our province, and Dr. Kevin Norrell. And of course, they're supported by a number of content experts and bring folks in. We, you know, they work very, very closely with a number of people. We know that we have uh, a, a lot of work to do in healthcare. The system is under strain, and it's been under strain for a long time. So after we formed government, um, this team and the other part of the team, including the Premier, we started in Neils Harbour, which is at the tip of Cape Breton, and we traveled all the way to Yarmouth. And what we wanted to do was talk directly to healthcare workers. We wanted to hear and understand the situation that they were experiencing. And the experiences in some ways were very different, perhaps in Metro or Neils Harbour or Canso or or Yarmouth, but it, they were also, there were a lot of similarities. And so we also wanted to hear their solutions. What did they, what did healthcare workers across all designations, healthcare workers including, you know, non-clinical folks, what did they think we could do in order to improve healthcare for Nova Scotians? And those voices informed Action for Health. So Action for Health is a plan, it's a strategic plan, it has six pillars. Uh, it's not a quick fix. Some things are quick, some things are medium, some things are long term, but this is our plan in terms of how we're going to address health care. And we've, you know, accountability is a very important part of that. We want to be able to measure our success, understand where there are shortcomings and continued shortcomings, and also be able to look at our progress. And so there's a website that accompanies that. So if you Google that, Action for Health, you'll get, the, you'll get the pillars, but there's also an accompanying website that will allow you to see the metrics that we use. Some are updated quarterly, some will be updated annually. It depends on the metric. So we, we are committed to, to continuing those metrics, to being transparent with Nova Scotians and really measuring our success and, and you know, pivoting where we need to in order to make those, those numbers better in some areas. So, Tonight is really about a discussion. Um, we want to understand, we know that there are challenges across Nova Scotians, we know that there are some challenges locally, but we also want to let you know what we've been doing for the last 15 months, and we want to hear your suggestions and your solutions. Answer your questions to the best of our ability. Um, we've gotten some really good suggestions and some good insight as we've traveled around, and so even though it is a bit of a question and answer, it also is a discussion, and it's important that we are here and we're you know, listening to one another and, and doing the best. So I'm looking forward to the discussion tonight. So before Janine and Karen speak, I'd like to introduce Tanya Nixon. I don't know where, there she is. So Tanya is going to come up. And Tanya, bring your team up. And they're going to spend a couple of minutes. This is your health leadership team in this area. I'm going to introduce themselves, talk a little bit about some of the things that are happening here, and, and then we'll move on from there. So we have lots of time. So we're, we're looking forward to uh, having these folks introduce themselves. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Hello? Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, there we go. Good evening, everyone. It's nice to see some familiar faces in the room. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm uh, Tanya Nixon. I'm the Vice President of Operations uh, here in the Western Zone. Myself, and uh, the team that's here, and a variety of healthcare leaders around the room from mental health, from primary health care, uh, our colleagues from Department of Health and Wellness and Continuing Care are here tonight really to listen and to learn from you around what's important uh, from your perspective in your community. As uh, Minister Thompson has said, over the last 15 months, we've spent a great deal of time listening. Um, we did the Stand Up and Listen Tour where we uh, participated in very intimate conversations across this zone and heard from both frontline staff and physicians around what was important to them. Um, as you can imagine, the last two and a half years has been uh, incredibly uh, challenging for healthcare workers uh, with COVID. Um, we have heard um, from, after we did the Stand Up and Listen tour, we then moved on to have some conversations with communities where there are rural emergency departments and those rural emergency departments have been experiencing increased numbers of closures. 
to hear about the impact around that, to talk to clinicians, physicians around what uh, is important from a working condition perspective to get them to come and work in these uh, areas. And uh, we have recently commenced stay interviews with our staff. Uh, really important to understand from the staff that are currently working uh, in the system what it is that keeps them working under the conditions that they're working in and trying to discern what we can replicate in other locations, what things we might have to stop or change. Uh, so we can not only retain those that are with us today, but we can recruit uh, additional staff to come in with them, come and work with them. Uh, another really substantial priority for all of us, um, my colleagues here will describe some of the efforts in detail, is how we improve access. Uh, whether that's surgical access, uh, same day, next day access, or emergency access, we want to be sure that people who require care have the most appropriate level of care available to them when they need that. So we're doing lots of different things right now. We're testing and trying a mobile pop-up unit. Uh, Joanne, my colleague from Primary Healthcare, will talk to you about that. We've been fortunate enough to have that mobile pop-up unit in Weymouth uh, this coming weekend. They'll be in Digby. Uh, we foresee that uh, mobile pop-up unit continuing here. Uh, this past weekend, that unit uh, was in Yarmouth and saw more than uh, 140 people in Yarmouth. Uh, we have an urgent treatment center that has opened uh, in Annapolis that provides same day, next day access, and more than 39% of people that attend that uh, urgent treatment center come from Digby. Um, so those are incredibly important access points. So my colleagues here will talk a little bit about that. Recruitment and, and retention is really important. Uh, it's important that we come and talk to you about recruitment and retention because what we know for sure is while we can identify um, people, communities uh, also recruit and retain uh, healthcare providers. People who we, we identify through application processes, they want to come and be uh, interconnected with their communities. It's often where they bring uh, their partners, where their children become involved in school and extracurricular activities. So it's really important that you hear from our physician colleagues and we hear what is really important in your community so we can go out and we can talk about that and we can represent that uh, well. And if uh, there are those of you in the community that aren't engaged in physician and or other healthcare provider recruitment activities and you want to be, we want to know about you so we can get you tapped into that activity. So I'm going to introduce some of my colleagues and ask them to share a little bit around what they do. Uh, so to my right is Allison Lamb and she is the Executive Director of Health Services in the Zone. Hello everybody, nice to see you all. So like Tanya said, I'm Allison Lamb and I am the uh, Executive Director of Health Services. So my responsibility really is the three regionals in the zone, so Valley Regional, Yarmouth Regional, and South Shore Regional. And a lot of our focus over the last 15 months has been uh, increasing our surgical access in the regional sites. So ensuring we got back to our 2019 levels, so pre-COVID levels, which we have achieved. So we've worked with the teams to enhance our nursing staff, uh, increase the hours that our ORs are operating, and really focus on some of those long waiters. So uh, in the zone, it is looking at our hip and knee replacement line um, and cataracts, which are, tend to be our longest waiters. So we are really looking at how do we shift uh, our teams to do more day surgery and really meet the needs of the community. So that's been a, a lot of focus and a lot of work for our perioperative teams. Uh, in addition to a lot of work around recruitment, uh, both for nurses, uh, registered or registered nurses, licensed practical nurses, along with all of the other members of the team that support, so respiratory therapy, PT, OT, et cetera. So really making sure we have, uh, know what people want in a, and are working to their scopes of practice. So everybody is doing uh, an equal and the work they want to do on the team that really meets the needs of the patients and ensuring we're optimizing all those scopes of practice. So that's been the focus in the regionals uh, and really working collaboratively with our communities uh, and our community sites. So the opportunity I was saying to Ruth tonight, oftentimes we have patients that may come into Digby ED. You don't necessarily have to transport to a regional center. We can consult with the virtual technology that we have, which saves a back and forth, and then we know if we need to transport. So there's some opportunities that we've been leveraging across the system to really improve access, uh, and that has come through the, you know, some of the 
advantages uh, of COVID have been a really opportunity to increase our virtual technology, which has made a big difference. And most recently, uh, the work we're doing to really ensure that we have capacity for our respiratory season, both from a pediatric uh, and an adult front, obviously in our regional centers, that's really important given the flu season that we're currently experiencing. So that's been the focus of what I do on a regular basis. Um, and some of the stay interviews that we've conducted too, because the regional sites uh, are, um, noting that we really want to make sure that our staff are happy doing what they're doing. So some of the things that we're hearing on the stay inners is things like self-scheduling. Let me choose the shifts that I want to work that will make it work for my family. So how do we adjust on our, oftentimes nurses used to work for two days, two nights, and then off for five if they work full time. So adjusting that so they have fluidity in their schedule to meet their needs, still work the same amount of hours, but those shifts are focused differently. So really working with our staff to understand what works for them so they want to stay, we keep their skill set, and we keep them in our communities. Um, so that kind of gives you a sense of what I'm gonna, I've am gonna. i been doing uh, along with the team, and I'll hand it over to Dr. Pugh. Thank you. Um, my name is Cheryl Pugh. I am an obstetrician gynecologist, and my clinical practice is in Bridgewater on the South Shore. My role with Nova Scotia Health is the medical executive director, and basically what that means is I'm the physician lead for the Western Zone. And Western Zone, it always actually makes me a little bit, um, I can't even really quite think of the right word, but I, I feel very honored to be a part of the Western Zone, and I feel that the geographic expanse is huge. So when you think about who we actually serve in our zone, it's Yarmouth to Kentville to Bridgewater and every little community in between. So that's huge. So the people that you see in front of you actually provide strategy for all of that geographic area. And my role as a physician lead is that we have physician leaders in each of those communities. And we help with the strategy around how do we deliver care. We provide a bit of a clinical lens, more than a bit of a clinical lens, I like to think, and add our uh, expertise to how do we actually de de deliver excellent care to you as the people who we are here to serve. So the, the role, my role is to put my head together with these smart people that you see in front of you. And as a uh, team, we try to aim to give you the best possible care we can with the resources that we have in front of us, which are not necessarily always exactly as we want them to be. I'm gonna pass it over to Ruth, who you probably all know very well. Hi, I'm, I'm Ruth White Frizzle. I'm the Clinical Health Services Manager and Site Lead for Digby General Hospital. Thank you very much for all coming tonight. I wanna to speak a little bit about the services that we offer in the facility. Um, but before I do, I'd, I'd like to um, thank you all for your patience with, with our closures that we have been having in the emergency department. Um, as, as with the rest of the province, we are struggling to find um, physician coverage 24 hours a day for our emergency departments. And we're also struggling with, with our, um, our licensed staff, including our registered nurses in our emergency departments as well. Um, we are targeting to have our um, emergency department open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But right now with our, our human resources, that is um, unlikely and, and it's, it's, it's a challenge for all of us. We are um, making a concerted effort to make sure that any of our nursing shortages are lining up with our physician shortages so that we can make sure that we are open as, as, many, as many hours as we can be to serve the, to serve the, the communities. Um, we do have a nurse practitioner in our emergency department on the, the weekdays and weekends during daytime hours. This nurse practitioner helps, um, helps provide extra coverage to you. They work in collaboration with the physician in the emergency department to, to see you and get you through the department and meet your needs. Um, and they also work um, independent from the physician to, to see the, the triage levels, the fours and fives when you're coming in for, for the lower acuity um, needs that you have. And that includes your prescription refills. There are so many of us, myself included right now, without family practitioners, and we have to rely on, on um, different aspects to get our prescriptions. I think somebody may be talking to virtual care this evening. Okay, perfect. So that, that's, that will become an option more and more for us for, for those prescription refills, for example. Um, we have our consultant's clinic in the basement. We do have um, a physician who provides service to unattached patients in that clinic three days a week. Um, I'm sure many of you are, are aware of that clinic. Show of hands, okay. 
So you can access that clinic. We are booking um, typically two weeks in advance. So if you're looking and you know that your prescriptions are coming up in a couple of weeks, please call the main switchboard and they can put you through to the consultant's clinic. Um, the extension is 3282 if anyone has a pen. Very lucky. Um, just checking my hand here. I don't want to miss anything. Um, as as, as um, Allison had mentioned, we also have telehealth options for um, to connect you with service providers, um, the specialist in, in the city most, mostly, and up the valley. So if you're unable to travel to appointments um, to Halifax, we are able to, to connect you with telehealth options through the hospital. Um, getting back to our recruiting efforts, we, Nova Scotia Health has been doing some, um, some heavy recruiting for RNs. We, we also have shortages with, with most of our licensed staff. Um, diagnostic imaging, we're seeing, we're seeing shortages across, across most of the province with DI techs, um, lab techs, um, for even, even pharmacy techs and, and pharmacists. So we are trying our, our very best to recruit. Um, I can speak to the nursing a little bit. We have been doing for, I think this is our third year now, we've been doing some um, recruitment efforts across Atlantic Canada. We've been going to um, the universities across Atlantic Canada who host the, the BN programs at their facilities. Um, and we meet, we meet with the, the third and, and fourth year students and, and sometimes the second years as well to see um, and, and introduce them to, to Nova Scotia Health and how, how life looks within Nova Scotia Health, the options for employment. Um, every new grad graduating in Nova Scotia from the BN program is offered permanent position with, within Nova Scotia Health as well. Um, we are um, also reaching out to travel companies. I'm sure any of you who have visited our, our emergency departments across the province have come in touch with our travel nurses. Um, this, is, this is an effort to make sure that we're meeting our core staffing needs. Um, but the travel companies are also struggling with, with RN recruitment across the country and, and, and DI techs, for example. Um, so we're, we're reaching out to other travel companies as well to, to try and bring in providers to, to make sure that we're meeting our community's needs. Thank you. I will introduce you to Joanne Wenzel with Public Health, or excuse me, Primary Health. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Awesome, thanks Tamara for the thumbs up. It's, I'm really honored to be here tonight and, and really listen um, to folks and hear ideas and suggestions. I think that's really important in these conversations. Um, I, my name is Joanne Wenzel and I work as the Director of Primary Health Care for The Zone. And that means I really have the privilege of working with teams of physicians, nurse practitioners, licensed practical nurses, um, RNs and dietitians and, and physiotherapists every day. So it's really a really privileged um, op job that I have to really work with folks. We're really focused on thinking about how we strengthen our ability to provide access to primary care. And I know it's a challenge in this community. We're also really focused on being very creative. Everyone, all of my colleagues here mentioned about recruitment and retention. And we're really focused on trying to be as creative as we can to build our team so that we can actually meet the needs in the communities. Um, a couple of things I thought I would mention that, because I had the opportunity. Um, we, we really value nurse practitioners as part of our teams um, and we've struggled with recruitment. And I need to say that we've had some successes. So we've recruited a nurse practitioner who's come to us from outside of Canada. She's come, from, uh, come to us from the United States and we learned a lot in that process, um, but we're really privileged to have Courtney as part of our team but so we're really focused inside Nova Scotia across Canada and even beyond to recruit to our teams the other piece that we've tried and actually has been really successful in Digby um, we call it our NP locum program so I call it the test and try approach so we're really open to having NPs from anywhere come join our team for, and stay a little bit or stay a little longer so it does two things. It really introduces, in, introduces the nurse practitioners to the team, the community, and you get to test and try the community just to, to, to think maybe at some point I might like to come back and stay. Um, so we've actually been successful with two nurse practitioners that co have come to us and are providing care at that, the collaborative practice. I know Laura's here with us tonight and I told her I was going to do a bit of a shout out when I had the chance to talk. So Laura's here. Laura's actually from Ontario. Laura has come to 
practice with us in Digby twice now. And Laura, you're here until the end of May right now. Um, and Oh, Laura, do you mind standing up? I actually think I have two other team members here that are crying to hide, and I'm just going to go for it right now. So um, Chantal Hazelton, and I bet many of you in, in the audience know Chantal, and I'll get her to stand up and we'll do a shout out as well. Chantal is licensed practical nurse, I want to say extreme, but um, extraordinary. extraordinary, that's the word I want it, a little bit of nerves in here, right? So extraordinary and really is our team lead for the practice. And then Nina, then Nina is another nurse practitioner with our team. And Vanita, I'm trying to remember, because, you know, sometimes I don't remember. You've come to us from Newfoundland. Newf yeah, so we really, want, we really try to be creative and look outside and inside um, the province to support. So I'm excited about the NP Locum program. That's made a, made a difference. Oh, okay. So I wanted to mention that. That's a strategy we'll continue with. Of course, we're focused on long-term recruitment, but that's a strategy to invite people to come work with us for a while. Um, and, you know, those short-term opportunities are great. Um, you get familiar with the community and also provide a lot of care while you're here in the community, so we appreciate that. The other piece that's new for our team in Digby, um, we just added, and I'm looking at the team, three weeks, a new f a pharmacist, a new October 31st. So we now have a pharmacist as part of our team in Digby as well, and we're, we have pharmacists directly working in our collaborative practice teams in other areas in the Western Zone, so it's a really great opportunity to learn from them and then also then add, and his name is Ian, um, as well as add Ian to our mix on, in, our, in our team. Um, also coming soon, um, we really wanted to add a social worker to our team as well. So we do have someone lined up, which is great from a recruitment perspective, that's going to start working with us in January. So that's a little bit about the team. We're really focused on trying to be as creative as we can around access. Um, we know it's hard, um, but the team's working hard to really try to maintain access to primary care. The other, um, I'll mention just a little bit, because I know um, Karen and, and Janine, you'll probably talk about this, virtual care. But I would really encourage you, if you're registered on the Need a Family Practice Registry and you haven't yet accessed virtual care, I access personal care, and sometimes it's a little hard for me, but we actually have Michelle in the back of the room. She has got the tips and the tricks if you've ever had challenges in trying to sign up for virtual care in Nova Scotia. So definitely someone that can really help you navigate that if, if um, you wanted to ask more questions. And I think the final thing I'll mention, Tanya referenced it, you know, we're, we're about testing and trying and trying to figure out you know, how can we provide additional access for communities? And we, d we have been fortunate in the zone to have the mobile clinic come to both Yarmouth and then a couple weeks ago in Weymouth. So I know in Weymouth, our data was 77 patients um, were seen during that weekend. And we do have the clinic coming back again. So two days in Digby upcoming this week and then on Monday um, back to Weymouth again. So an additional access point for the community. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So it's important to hear locally what's happening. Um, just quickly, um, um, Janine is just going to say a few things, and Karen, and then we're going to get to the crowd. So we just want to kind of set the stage and tell you a little bit about what's happening, and then maybe it would help narrow or inform or maybe create some questions. So good evening, everyone. Is that one okay? Is it on? Um, it's great to be here tonight, and I, ha I have to say, I think this is the largest crowd maybe that we've had so far in our 13 uh, sessions, so it's fantastic to see so many folks out tonight. So uh, one of the things that I'm going to give you a bit of information on is the emergency health services, our, our ambulance service. So um, I'm, you might know that the service is run by uh, an independent company, uh, emergency EMCI, and the department operates as the regulator of that service. So we have a couple of folks from the department who work in EHS at the back of the room and they're going to help me out if um, I get any of these things wrong or if you have detailed questions that I don't have uh, all of the information on. Oh, Jeff's over there. Great. 
So um, what we've really been trying to do related to EHS is to prevent people from having to be transferred by ambulance. So that doesn't mean if you need one that you, we don't want you to have one, but a number of the calls that we get that EHS get each day, and I think it's, is it up to 70%, Jeff? Up to 70% of the calls that EHS would get each day are calls that people actually do not need to be transferred to the emergency department, but they do need some kind of care. And so what we've tried to do is implement some new measures through the provider so that those people still get care, but they just don't get taken to the emergency department. So one of the things that we've done is for almost a year now, I think we've had the physician in the uh, medical communication center. So when a call comes in to the center, there is a physician there who can help to triage with the other people in the center, the person, and to say, we do think you need care, but we don't think that you probably need to be transported to the ED. And so we're going to stay with you and we're going to keep connected with you through the telephone until we get the care to you that you need. And one of the things that we do have now in a couple of areas in the province, I don't think they're here here in Digby, there's no spear units here, is that correct, Jeff? No, not a regular basis, is that we do have in some areas a single paramedic response. And so it's a paramedic that essentially goes out in an SUV to see some of these people who need care but don't need to be transported. And through the use of the physician in the communication center and these single paramedic response units, we've reduced transfers by about 3,200 per month to the emergency department. So that helps people get care where they need it, when they need it, and then also helps to reduce transfers that are being made to the emergency departments, which we know right now are considerably stressed and there are a lot of folks going through them. The other thing that we've done to ensure that there are paramedics and trucks available when those calls are needed is we've instituted a new patient transfer model. And we have uh, transport drivers now that are not paramedics. And so what we've been able to do is almost all of our transfers, about 80%, used to be done by paramedic, driver, and other person on the truck. But now we've reduced that down to about 20%. And so again, that allows for the paramedics to be on the trucks for the emergency calls that we need them to respond to. And we're hopeful that we might be able to get that number down to 5%. So again, it's just another place where we are getting people, making sure that the people who we need in those emergency response situations are, are available for, uh, for that. So the last thing on that front is we're also working, and I see that Kevin McMullen is here with us again tonight at the back of the room. He's with the paramedics union. And the department, the union, the employer, uh, NSHA, IWK, and the Paramedics College have been working together um, looking at working conditions for paramedics because we know, like all of our healthcare workers, um, that they've been through a lot as well over the last number of years and just really trying to find things that will help them with their working conditions, trying to get better at, you know, shifts ending when they should be ending, hopefully getting breaks, but just looking at overall ideas um, from all parties um, that we can work to implement to, to help improve the working conditions for paramedics. Um, I think that that's all on EHS. You want to take the next one? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, first thing I want to do, and I do this in every session, but I, I don't want to deviate, uh, is just ask our frontline healthcare workers to just give a wave, those in the back and those that may be elsewhere in the audience. Just, just give a wave. Yep. So... That wasn't a very big wave. Uh, and, and the reason why I ask that is because um, I like to start by saying thank you. And, you know, yes, exactly. Yes, thank you. I remind folks that, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, the country, countries around the world, even Will and Kate, we're out banging pots for healthcare workers and waving flags and giving Tim Hortons cards and saying thank you to our healthcare heroes. And somewhere along the way, that went by the by. I'm not sure when it was, doesn't really matter. But we, we have a situation now where, um, you know, a lot of times our, our frontline providers are yelled at, they're getting 
they're, they're receiving the butt end of, of frustration uh, within the system. And so not a day goes by that I don't uh, think of that and say thank you. And I want us all to do the same thing. We need to be patient and kind because we, we need these folks. And so thank you to all of you. So I'm going to take a minute to just talk about um, the other the other themes that came out of the questions that were uh, submitted. One was uh, the retention and recruitment, and the other was um, access. So thanks to Ruth and uh, Joanne, they kind of took the thunder. And and what I would say, no, in a great way, how exciting it was for me to sit here and to listen to all of the things that are being done by your local leaders. I mean, they're taking the bull by the horns. They're taking the initiative. So for me, however I can support that, whatever, whatever they need that, that we could do to help accelerate that, support that, further that, you know, that's kind of where, where I am. So, I'd, so I'd, I hadn't met Ruth before, nor Joanne, so it was a pleasure to hear both of you, and um, you have my commitment to, to help you with the initiatives that you already have underway. So you just have to let me know. Now, having said that, big picture, um, you know, recruitment and retention is very key, obviously, to, uh, you know, the entire system. Um, you know, right now we would have, I think the last number I saw was 1,667 uh, nursing vacancies. So if you think about our nursing schools in the province between um, Dalhousie, Santa Vex, and CBU, the number of nurses currently being produced is not enough. And we've, we've already added 200 seats. And we've added more LPN seats. But if you do the math in your head between retirements, um, maternity leaves, leaves of absence, people who decide to pursue a different profession, there's still a gap. So we need to, we need to bridge the gap. So uh, every idea that you've heard uh, from Joanne and others tonight, those are great ideas. But um, we also need to look at ways that we can extend our pipeline. So we are doing that through immigration and through, for example, I have uh, a, f a person who's in India this week who's do visiting four Indian nursing schools to help to build our pipeline uh, into, into that country. And that could, be a, any, that could be a couple of different things. So for example, if we only have so many seats in Nova Scotia, so many instructors, so many faculty members, there's no reason why through a, a bridging program with an Indian university or any other university that we can't send Nova Scotian students to India to be educated there coming back to Nova Scotia. So these are the kinds of partnerships that, that we're looking at. India is one country, uh, the Philippines is another country, and I'll share this one with you as well. So people say, all oh, right, Karen, what do you hope to get out of these sessions? What are, you, what are you doing? What do you hope to get out of these conversations? And they really are two-way conversations. We are going to come to some questions in a, in a moment. But I'll share this story because this was a tangible outcome of, of a session. Two weeks ago, we were in Cherry Brook, which is um, uh, we, and we had our session at the Black Cultural Center. And after the session, um, an RN, whose name is Eunice, can't pronounce her last name, uh, Eunice came to see me and she said she had immigrated from Nigeria and she had a lot of classmates and other folks um, from Nigeria who were either in Canada and wanted to be working or who were interested in coming to Canada. So I said, great, come, come and see me next week. So last week she did come, and, uh, she, and we set her, I set her up with a team. And sure enough, within, within the week, she had eight friends who were RNs in Nigeria. They were here in Canada working as either CCAs or LPNs, but with some bridging, could be RNs in our system. Okay, that was one conversation at one public session. A second one, 
uh, which took place in the summer at um, Fisherman's Memorial. Cheryl was there, I think. I can't remember. Allison was there. We were there. We wanted our picture taken uh, t t with the staff, with the staff, with the staff. And I asked, and I asked, um, I walked down the hall to see if I could get somebody to take the picture. And there was a young fellow, a young person with the name tag, Jojo R.N. So, Jojo, will you take the picture? Sure, I will. So, Jojo, where are you from? He said, well, I'm, I'm originally from India. I went to the University of Kerala. I've been here for 10 years. And he explained to me he, had, he didn't at that time have any trouble coming to Canada and becoming certified to practice here. But he had 10 friends in Bridgewater who were having the dickens of a time trying to get into NSH. So, same thing. Jojo has worked with his, his 10 friends and we're now bridging them into roles within the Nova Scotia health system. I share these two stories because you never know where the healthcare worker, where the next recruit might be. And I know from talking to Jill that you now have a community navigator here, which is great. And it's, it, it will be really important for the community to support that navigator, to share information, to you know, really help that navigator in any way possible. Because healthcare workers are recruited to communities where they are um, embraced, where they're welcome, where they're supported. And you know, that kind of takes me to another issue, which, uh, which Jill also mentioned before the session started. And, and somebody here somewhere tonight could, could explain it to me, but I understand that not in the last year, but perhaps two to three years ago, there were two young physicians who, who left Digby and question mark, why did they leave? So, so, you know, I'd be very interested in trying to understand that. Now, having said that, we don't uh, do an exit interview for everybody, but we do try. And if somebody wants to do an exit interview, then we definitely want to hear from the individual why they are leaving. So sometimes people want to share and sometimes people don't want to share. So, you know, I, I'll just simply say to you that, you know, I, I'm all in for any information that is going to help us to support, encourage, uh, retain people. Um, really, any idea is a good idea. Uh, I'll just maybe finish by saying that um, one, of the, one of the single biggest recruiting efforts that we have across the province, but particularly um, in, in the Western Zone, is for anesthesiologists. So we are looking at a number of different programs to help to make sure that we can um, you know, have anesthesi anesthesiology services when required. So for example, there's a, um, a group of physicians, family practice anesthesia program. So we're looking at that, but that doesn't replace the full scale anesthesiologist in, for all surgeries. So that's really high on the list, very high on the list, not just in this zone, but, but here in particular. So we, d we really do look at what's required. Now, trust me, I will take any doctor anywhere. No, I shouldn't say any doctor anywhere, anytime, but, but pretty close. Uh, so we, we look wherever we can find uh, folks that want to come to Nova Scotia. And so I'm going to stop there because I know there's lots of questions. So, so we kind of had a precursor of what was on your minds, but uh, you know, we're, we're, we'll do our best to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you. And I feel like that did, I have some of the pre-submitted questions here, and I do feel like that answered a fair number of them. So I think what we'll do is go to the audience right away. And if, if you're stumped, I can take some of the pre-submitted questions. Yeah, so what I'm, and I'm, what I'm gonna do, and I always just, we've done this a little bit, and I always say, I know it's rude to point, but I don't know how else to do it. So I'm gonna point at you when, when you're up, and I'll try to count off. I am going to say it is a big group, and like I said before, if someone's asked your question, if you could please hold your question so we can get to as many topics as possible. If we don't get to you, so if we get to, you know, 
it's nine o'clock and we're ready to shut it down, please know that if you put your name and number and your question on a card that, were at, that was at the desk when you come in, someone will get back to you. So I don't want anyone to leave feeling like they haven't been heard. We're gonna try to get to as many people as possible. Is that, I always say I do my teacher mode and I look for nods of the head, so yes. Okay, so we've got question, first question right here. So thank you for sharing that one. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that makes me crazy. And, you know, that's exactly what we're trying to grapple with. So on your first point, um, you're hired. So just, <laughs> just, just give me your name after. Uh, and, the, and, and all of those rules. No, I don't want to hear it. You're hired. <laughs> and, and all of those rules that you talked about, actually, uh, much of that has been changed. Yeah. Of course you should, and so you're hired. And, and your friends too that you alluded to, okay? So you're hearing it here from me first, and uh, if there's any problem, you let me know. So that's number one. On the ticks, it obviously, um, you know, so we, we were in Lunenburg, ground zero, and I, I don't really know, I'm sure it must be pretty close behind here. And so it's, it's a big issue. It's becoming a bigger issue. Um, you know, not just Lyme, but also tick-borne diseases. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Easy. So we've made a note of that. It's a great suggestion, and I really appreciate it. So, so thank you. Thanks for coming tonight. Thank you. I always feel like when when the no, when I watch the the team, they all write down the notes, and you know that it's a suggestion that's uh, well considered. Thank you. Oh, another question over here. Okay. Hi, I have multiple, but um, one of the biggest things is that. Um, I do believe that I've been able to keep a lot of my family members alive because I know how to navigate the system in a multiple different ways. But um, in the last six months, what I've had to do to keep my grandparents literally alive, which I tell them every day, they make it very hard for me to keep them alive. Um, 
but it takes a year to get an echo. So when I called and I asked about that echo, I said, my grandfather's 93, so in a year's time, he's probably gonna be dead. So we'll cut him off the list. But I did ask her, which most people won't do, is say, do you have a cancellation list? Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. She said, yes, this was on a Thursday. My grandmother gets a call on a Monday, and I take him down on the Wednesday to get an echo, because there was four cancellations. Mm -hmm. So how many people don't even know to even call, make sure the rec gets in? Mm -hmm. And how many times does that get missed? Which my father-in-law would have never got his knee surgery, because that fax never went through. Um, my husband as well, if I didn't do everything under my power of what I knew to wait for his neurologist appointment would have been over three and a half years to even just get the consultation. So for us to say that we provide services and you have to wait three and a half years with severe migraines that you can't even move as well as anybody else that has their own ailments, that's not a service that we're providing. So we need to think about that. What I do think as a solution is actually having navigators because there are, again, if we look at our population and what you're saying of who's utilizing all of these services that we have and our population, though everybody's excited, is growing, we are not going to get any younger in this um, province of ours. As we know, I'm sure you guys are aware of the landmark study. So, you know, we're only going to get older, not younger in this province, even though we're over a million. So. We don't have anybody to support these people. And even if you're younger, so many people, if you're not in it, have no idea what is going on. So we need people that can help these people, even just making a call to make sure that their consultation's through. Because here they are knowing it's gonna take two to three years to get their knee surgery. Lo and behold, they actually don't even have the paperwork because they would never think in a million years that they would have to call to make sure that that fax got through. And that's where we rely on the system, thinking that they are going to do it. And not by, you know, malicious in any way, but things are missed. My father waited his 12 hours for almost breaking his fingers. And when he went to get his medication, it didn't go through. So is he going to sit there for another 12 hours because of that? So he suffered. So we need those kinds of people to help. Otherwise, they're going to come in every single time in crisis mode because of those simple little things of someone that's able to navigate for them. Yeah, thank you. I, you're right. So there's a couple of things there. Um, I do want to let you know that one of the issues we're really struggling with is our digital platform. So we uh, have a lot of systems in this province, uh, you know, digital platforms that don't speak to one another. So one of the things that we are developing is a single electronic entry point for referral uh, for um, tests, DI tests, and also for surgeries. So the other issue is that uh, our primary care providers don't often know, to your point around lists, they don't know how long lists are for certain physicians, like if you're waiting for a hip or a knee. But when we centralize that, we will be able to, A, have one place where referrals come, and we'll be able to look at surgical wait time lists and say, you know, if you want to see this physician, this is how long the wait time will be. But if you're open to seeing a variety of physicians in this general area, then this is what the wait time will be. And it will allow us to be more agile in terms of how we approach that, and it will be electronic. So you would get receipt immediately. One patient, one record as well is very important to us, and we are hoping, we recently had an opportunity, we were invited to Denmark, and really looked at what the democratization of, of a patient record could look like. So not only did every care provider have access to a patient record, the patient themselves had access to the record, which allowed them to be able to advocate for themselves in a very different way. So the, our, we're outdated, is what I would say, um, to be generous. And so it's very, very important that we leverage technology so that we are able to streamline our processes, really be able to understand where our assets are. So, you know, maybe there's a CT scanner not that far from you where you can get the test that you need and really looking at making ourselves more efficient, cutting that red tape, making sure that those loopholes are closed so that we're able to uh, streamline our services. And certainly that one patient, one record. So all of our providers... You don't have to tell your story. We hear from patients. I have to tell my story again and again and again and again and again wherever I go. And it's very frustrating for folks. So trying to reduce that and giving people the opportunity to have their own record, but also um, making sure that clinics and emergency rooms and providers all have the same information so that we're better able to give care. So those are some of the things that are underway now. So I 
I, I totally agree with everything, but it's the preventative, right? Because we're kind of in a crisis mode, so we're doing everything we can to do what we have here. But so again, going back to my grandfather's case, so he went into CHF, he went into acute kidney injury four weeks later, just brought him home again on Tuesday. I have used Dr. Brasado, which is great. I have an appointment for him. I go to book him the blood work to make sure that he doesn't die on me in the meantime. And um, the appointment for the blood work is the same day as his appointment. So I said, I'm gonna call and I'm gonna, you know, plead my case and hopefully by calling I can get in the day before so when I go to this appointment that they're gonna have the blood work. So going to a doctor's appointment is not an urgent request. So I'm not sure if people are aware, but we don't actually have that many. We have Dr. Black, who has been here for a long time and is gonna retire at any point in time, and we have Dr. Brasado or anybody else that you get in for a medical appointment. So I'm still gonna take him there, but it's going to defeat the purpose of me being proactive so that I can keep my grandfather at home and not utilize the emergency department. So it's as simple as the blood work that I am trying to do to help the system mm -hmm. that is limiting what is potentially to happen before Christmas again. Yeah, I mean, yes, agreed. And so we, we know, and now fixing is the challenge, okay? So, so it's a good example and just reminds me as well, you know, um, the touring at the Cobequid this summer where folks were coming from Cape Breton to receive cancer treatment at Cobequid and um, were s could have gotten blood work there but were turned away because they didn't have an appointment and then had to go all the way back to Cape Breton and the same story that you described. So, so uh, we are aware of it and, and as I say, fixing it is, is uh, the next part of it. So, so the good news is you're doing everything that you humanly can and we really appreciate that. Like not everybody does that. Uh, it takes a lot of work and a lot of stick to because it's really, really frustrating. And you never get a person, you only ever get a voicemail and the voicemails often aren't, they don't really sound friendly. So it's not, it, 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 it's just not a user friendly uh, environment. And so I, I take your point and uh, I might get your name after and sort of have a let you know kind of in a bit more detail what we're what we're thinking. Sure so thing. you got you got navigators. I made that note, and that's something we talk about all the time. But I'm not sure that's the only answer. There's a whole bunch more too. Okay, thank you. I know. Do you have a you have a, I know I have a submitted question here too. But do you have a, a question you want to ask as well? Yep. So I'll, I'll, I don't know the exact details of that, but I can talk a little bit about the system strain. So besides these four hours, he just wants to also add. Oh, sorry. The hospital was closed. Add another hour on, come back to go to the army. Mm -hmm. Just off the top of my head, the stroke system, who had the primary care doctor, 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 who had the surgery. So uh, he had to fast that day to have the surgery. 10 o'clock that night he told that he was bumped. He won't be having it today. The next day he was going to have it. But at 10 o'clock he was bumped again. He won't be having it that day. This went on for four days. Knowing that you could probably bleed, die, because you're going to have this clot gone. 
but you were bumped because somebody else needed the OR. And then to come home healing, to have it again, and also wait four hours on a floor is unacceptable, and another hour to get to a doctor. So we know that our paramedic system, our EHS system, is very strained, and um, it's been strained for, for a while. One of the things, I think uh, Janine spoke about it earlier, so we, I want you to know that we have world-class paramedics. Our paramedics are trained incredibly well. They are very, very capable, to your point, sir, uh, very, very skilled and capable. A number of our paramedics uh, have been responding to either low acuity calls or were tied up with transfers. So there is a lot of transformation that's being un underway. I don't know where, there's Jeff. Jeff, is there things that you want to talk about specifically or we can we can talk to you afterwards about your case but but separating the emergency calls from the transfers is really important because it redirects our very skilled workforce to emergency calls we also know that when folks are in emergency rooms and it takes a while for us to offload patients which means it takes time for the the care to be transferred from the paramedics to the nursing staff in the department it delays our paramedics from um, dropping that patient off and returning. So in a number of hospitals, we're looking at offload teams to support timely, timely transfer of care so that our paramedics can get back out on the road. So we do have that committee. We're working very hard. W we do have a number of vacancies, and we have a number of yeah vacancies and paramedics who, who are off that we're trying to support to bring back to work. So I'm very sorry for the experience that you had, and I would like to talk to you afterwards to see if there's more we can find out about the actual day that that, that happened, uh, that you experienced that. But I do want to assure you that we are very focused on our paramedic workforce. In EHS is essential in our province in order for us to have a world-class healthcare system, and we are committed to working with uh, with the, the the provider, with the union, with the medics, in order to to improve the conditions for the paramedics and the service that they provide. Okay. Oh, okay. I knew, I knew I saw somebody else's hand up. So we have a question here, and then I think another question over here. So all right, over. Again, doing the pointing thing. I'm sorry, but. Okay. Uh, when are you going to sit down with all of the other departments and work together? Because you cannot fix the medicine without fixing everything else. This isn't just healthcare. This is our education system, it's our housing, our economy. This, we can't wait months. We can't wait years for plans to be implemented. We need doctors now. We need jobs. We need proper education, proper childcare. Are you willing to sit with the other departments and work with them? We're sitting. I'll tell you right now, we're sitting. We're, we, we are doing all of those things. So, you know, in order for us to have, you know, one of the things I talk about is healthcare. The, in our rural communities, there are jobs for our youth in every single rural community in our province in healthcare. And what we need to do is identify people early, get into the schools, make sure that they're prepared, that they can come in and come through um, in terms of the healthcare pieces we are recruiting. Um, I work with Jill uh, in, in labor skills and immigration. I work with Becky Druin. We work with housing, supportive housing programs, working with Department of Community Services and hu Housing and Municipal Affairs. So I can assure you that part of the transformation, we can't bite around the edges anymore. We have to transform. We have to. And, and I tell my colleagues, uh, Minister Balser will tell you, I often say I am the minister of the health care system or the minister of illness, and every one of them is the minister of health. So what happens in education, what happens in economic development, what happens in municipal affairs, all of those things are social determinants of health and we have to look at those, not only to look at how we deliver care for people who are sick, but also what are the things we do to prevent illness or stop illness when it starts. So it is a huge undertaking. Uh, our, our colleagues in public health, we're looking at poverty reduction as well. There's a poverty reduction table. So I do want to assure you, you go ahead, that there is 
there is a lot of work because you're absolutely right. This is a this is a web, and we need to improve. We have to float all boats. So we're going to tell you a little story that happened this morning. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. As recent as this morning, uh, Karen and I were with all of our uh, uh, all of my deputy minister colleagues from all of the other departments, and we had this exact conversation. We were talking about you know the interconnections of the system and what we can do, what we need to partner with them on, what we need them to be taking the lead on. So I can I can guarantee you it's it's happening every week, maybe not every day, but at least every week there's a large group of us to get together. But I'd say at least every day I talk with one of my other colleagues about these exact issues. Janine's nice. She, she's the nice one. Okay, she's the nice one. And the minister's the really nice one. <laughs> so in that meeting today, we were told it would take two and a half years for something to happen. Okay, let's, let's just say it was a housing thing. That's when the top came off the blender, okay? Because I, we don't have two and a half years. We don't have it. So, you know, somebody's got to push, like, like we all need to, that we're all in it together. It, it's, it's, not a, it's not a one person, one department. We're all in it together. And, and what the minister has said and Janine has said is absolutely correct. We are working together. But you also need that person that really just pushes really hard so that people break through. Because two and a half years is too long. Um, and actually, you know, what, what we were doing, it was really, it was very important because we were looking at um, something which uh, we've started. It started in the uh, QE2, but it will be rolling out across the entire province. We're, we're calling it, it's, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a NASA control center, but basically it will, it, it shows the entire patient journey coming into the hospital, through the hospital, where, where there's an empty bed, where the person can go, like every, everything about the person coming into the hospital. And we, 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 we intend to roll that out across the province. And the reason I share it is because the, the deputies, so this is every deputy for every department, we allowed them to jump on to five minutes of the ops call. So this was 43 people in the hospital t looking at the data to see what we could do, where we can move people, where we can open beds, et cetera. And it got real very quickly because we were talking about surgeries and the cases, and the cases were very you know, critical cases and decisions have to get made. And I think you know, the deputies, um, once they heard that and saw that, like, holy, holy, holy cow, um, you know, I got to work harder. I got to work faster. I need to do more because they can see people and hearing the stories of people. They're not out doing what we're doing here. They're not listening to the story that you just told or the story that you just told. And so, you know, we, we're sharing these stories with them, but they also need to be hearing as well from their sphere. So, you know, t point is taken. We, we're on it. We agree. Thank you. We have, uh, yeah, do you want to put your hand up high? <laughs> so we know two and then, and then we'll get you in behind there. So one, then two. Oh, and then three. Oh, okay. Now we're at four and we'll just, uh, we'll pause at three. Okay. <clears throat> that, everybody can hear? Um, my comment and questions are about Lyme disease. And my biggest question is why why we don't have better education in this province. We've had travel-related Lyme disease since the late 1990s. We've had locally acquired Lyme disease since 2002, 20 years. And it is still not being recognized. The general public haven't been, that's 20 years to educate the public about what to look for, what might be Lyme disease. That's 20 years to educate our frontline health care providers to, to make a rapid diagnosis. They're being told to diagnose on symptoms, not wait for test results, and get rapid treatment so that it shuts down the bacterium and it doesn't progress. That's not happening. Um, and and they're, they're not being treated properly. Just three very short stories that are all local. Um, a woman in Digby 
uh, didn't know what was wrong with her, but she wasn't feeling well. She went to Digby Oak Patients. She had um, three classic bullseye rashes. Um, it's, and um, she sat there, and the doctor at first didn't know what was wrong with her, but then he did diagnose her, and he gave her the prophylactic dose. He gave her one dose of two pills. For three, she had acute Lyme disease and should have had much more treatment than that. So that's, that was just in April of this year. Um, there was a 10-year-old boy in Middleton who spends a lot of time in the outdoors, and he was very, he became ill. His mom uh, suspected Lyme disease, took him to the physician. She had to insist on a test. The physician was not going to test the boy. She insisted, and he did comply and submitted the, the test and called her one evening and said the test came back positive. But because it was stage one, the boy didn't need treatment. And that is, there's your golden opportunity to shut down the disease progressing to a, to a higher level. So she did insist and she got 10 days antibiotic for her son. But if she hadn't intervened twice, first to get the testing and second to get the treatment, that wouldn't have happened. And the third was a boy from my community. He was about 12 years old. And he, you know, happy-go-lucky outdoor kid, um, all of a sudden started feeling unwell. Uh, he had erythema migraines, but it was not a bullseye. It was a band rash, but it was expanding and expanding. Um, headaches, nausea, couldn't get out of bed, two visits to a physician, didn't know what was wrong with him. Uh, when his knee swelled up, his parents just headed up to the IWK where he was immediately diagnosed with Lyme and treated. And his outcome was good. But it might not, if they didn't do that, it wouldn't have happened. So, I mean, we need to educate, we need public education for this. We need so much education for, for people to be aware of it and then to advocate for themselves to get treatment, the, what's needed, and then our frontline health care providers are not getting the message. And we've been told, I, I work, at, um, I'm active as a Lyme advocate. I think you met Donna, Karen, yep, in Halifax. Um, we need our frontline health care providers to be educated and we've been told that we can give them the information but we can't make them read it. So how many more people does that leave to fall through the gaps there? So thank you. Um, we have heard a bit on the tour. This isn't the first time that, that Lyme has come up. So there, I will just share for everybody since we have a, a crowd. Uh, there's a couple things. Uh, first of all, uh, we did, um, we did make some changes. So uh, th I think you had said earlier that pharmacists now, in terms of the preventative, if you do have, uh, you find a tick, if you take the tick to a local pharmacy, they do education and they're able to assess with w the assessment um, available to say whether or not you need to be treated and they can give you the treatment in a pharmacy. And, what, and that, was, that change was made to alleviate the need to always go to emergent. Of course, you need to know where they are and if they're open. But it's important that we've empowered our pharmacists to be able to do the preventative work. Not treatment. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Yeah, prophylactic, but not treatment. So we, we have heard about Lyme. We do have a program in place, and to your point, it is difficult. Um, you know, we do have certified medical education, CMEs, that we ask physicians and nurses to take. But I think there is you know, a, a bit of work for us to do. W we are looking at other jurisdictions to see how they are managing Lyme, specifically Manitoba. We heard from a, a colleague or a fellow advocate that there's some work happening there. So we know that there is a, a bit of a gap uh, and we're, we are looking at that and working with our public health colleagues around tick-borne illness to better understand how we, you know, there's a lot of surveillance that happens and how does that translate into frontline practice. So uh, your point is taken. I think there is more work for us to do to better understand. And we have avenues like Doctors Nova Scotia, places like that where we can try and get our information out to uh, primary care providers, the College of Nurses, for our nurse practitioners, uh, pharmacies, PANS is excellent partners.
So I think one of the main issues is the triage department where a lot of people show up and as a pharmacist we've had a lot of patients come and say I have this bullseye rash, I have this leg pain, I think I have Lyme but they've sent me back to the pharmacy. So that's a key part where the triage department yeah. should have better education yeah. because then this person is now sent back to a nine, ten hour wait potentially to get the treatment that we're not able to help them with. So I think education on the, f the front lines of the ER department is really important, not only for Lyme, but for several illnesses that are often referred back to the pharmacy. Thank you. Good idea. It's a great idea. So I, I, this is just my personal opinion, but when you have places in a province that are like ground zero for ticks, we should be very, we should be all over this in a proactive way. Okay, that is what I said in Lunenburg. That is what I believe. I have gone back to my office. We have a little team put together to figure out what does this look like? What could these pathways be? Uh, we do have uh, one of our uh, physicians who, who runs the lab in uh, Halifax has already attracted federal funding to do some work around Lyme. So, you know, we, we could and should be doing a whole lot more. So, so I really appreciate this feedback because that's a good, your suggestion's a good one. The advocacy is important and, I mean, you know, this community was the second community to raise it, Lunenburg being the first, where it's a, where it's a major concern. So, you know, you, why would you sit there for nine hours or more in an emergency when we know what the problem is and we can deal with it in another way? Yeah, thank you. So I think we have one, and then two, three, and four, okay? Hi, okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so I guess my question is about um, prescriptions. Um, first of all, um, I think that the telehealth thing works, but they'll only give you one month prescription, as far as I can tell from other people. So that doesn't really help. Like I needed a cream for my foot, I need a, a year, pr a, prescription and they gave me one month and it doesn't help and she said well what you need to do is go to your <coughs> doctor which I don't have um, so and then I also wanted to add that I also called 911 and they didn't know which outpatients were open and they told me to call 911 and I called 911 and they didn't know either um, and Yarmouth and Digby and Annapolis were all closed so I am wondering um, is it possible like to give pharmacists more prescription power like do you have the power to give them that because i've traveled a lot and all i i would say all other continents um you can go into a pharmacy and get whatever you want so like if i need an inhaler i don't have to wait nine hours right if i want an antibiotic i don't have to wait 10 hours and that's, so that's my question. Great, Thank, thanks for that. Do you want to introduce Natalie, Janine? Yeah. This is uh, Natalie Borden. She's uh, one of the senior executive directors in the Department of Health and Wellness, and our pharmacare and pharmaceutical programs fall under her area of responsibility. So she can give you a bit of information. She is a pharmacist. Yeah, and she is, and she is, a, she is a pharmacist. Well. Um, actually, pharmacists do have a lot of ability now, um, particularly when it comes to what we call expanded scope of services because people tend to think of the pharmacist, I go, I get my medication. I know there was a pharmacist up here. I'm trying to see who it was, okay. <laughs> and there is sort of that, oh, they're just doing the dispensing, I'm just getting my medication. But pharmacists do have the ability to do a number of things and renewal of, renewal of prescriptions really is one of them. Um, so if it is, you know, they can do prescribing in some cases. No, actually it's not for one month. So there was recently a change in that they're actually able to do that for much longer. So it depends on the situation, it depends on the condition, but you're actually able to get more than a one month prescription from your pharmacist. 
your local pharmacist, you've been there on a regular basis, go in and have that conversation with them because in a lot of cases, they can alleviate some of that pressure because you're right. You know what, if you're calling, you're not getting that assistance, then you know your first trip I always say to folks should be to the pharmacy because there's a lot of things that they're able to do, particularly around the renewal um, of the prescription that would definitely help fill that gap in those situations. Notch. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Right. But the thing is, is under certain circumstances, the pharmacist can do that for you. I don't think there's a system anywhere where. Right. Right. Yeah. But but I think you can't. You, I don't think there's really many systems where you can just go in and say, "I need this," and get the prescription. There is an assessment that needs to be done. Well, I think in our system here in Nova Scotia, there is that assessment that needs to be done. The same would be done if you went to the physician or the nurse practitioner. The pharmacist is able to do that to fill that gap in those circumstances. So happy to talk a little bit more if you want, but I would really encourage you to have that conversation with your pharmacist in the community to talk about those services that they can provide. Yes, I'm gonna let a real live pharmacist in here. <laughs> So pharmacists definitely can provide several services. We can do renewals, we can do urinary tract infections, shingles, Lyme disease, you name it, we can do it. Um, one of the main problems in a community pharmacy is staffing yeah. and funding. Yeah. So one thing I will bring to the attention of whoever wants to listen is for a lot of the services that the association has allowed us to do, uh, we get paid very minimal for that compared to a physician did the same thing. Yeah. That is not a good business model. No. Um, I can prescribe a year's worth of four different medications for a patient. Yeah. They could all be different conditions. I could have to look at blood work, a, uh, A1Cs, kidney function, uh, glucose levels, take their blood pressure, go to town, spend an hour on it, and we get a measly $20 for that. So for my boss or any owner of a community pharmacy, this is not financially feasible. So a lot of the slack in the healthcare system has been picked up by pharmacists, but in such a way that it's like a fast food takeout type situation. Um, two things, one, we should get paid more so that we can actually do these services and not turn people away because we have to make a living like everyone else. And the second thing is um, educate the public on the fact that it isn't a fast food situation. Mm -hmm. So we have patients rolling in off the street with a day of 200 prescriptions plus to check, in immunization clinic, prescribing for multiple ailments, triaging because there's patients going next door with no open ER, no open ER in Annapolis, no open ER in Middleton. And they have, we're methadone clinics, they have boils on their leg that are about to fall off, but they've been told, go to your pharmacy because we're not open. So. We're in this situation where, yes, we can provide the services, but we don't have the time or the resources. Mm -hmm. okay. So some things need to change yeah. Thank you. in that situation. Yeah, and I think, yeah, it, particularly in rural, right? Because you're such a mainstay and I you're, and it's you're everywhere. It's expectation yep. from the patients where if you went to a dentist, a doctor, any other professional, you are not gonna walk in, walk to the back room, get treatment and be gone. Yeah. But it's looked at that that is how it is set up. Yeah. Um, so much some education yeah. for the public and a good colleagues and colleagues be to actually be yeah. able to do it financially That's good. Yeah. yeah and the fact of the matter is the discussion is that more scope be added to the pharmacist yeah. right <laughs> more and and I can tell you we are having those conversations so th so your your points are really good really um, uh, yeah I mean it's it's um, well, I, I've just lost my train of thought. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I'll come back to it. Yeah, I just wanted to add two quick things, and feel free to come and chat with me at the end because I'd love to fill you in a little bit more detail. So two things. Um, number one, we are currently working with Communications Nova Scotia and PANS on a campaign that will look at how do we really promote the expertise of pharmacists. Because I think, you know, from, uh, from my perspective, you know, pharmacists aren't filling a gap. They're professionals in their own right, and we need to make sure that people are aware of that and are aware of what services they can get. 
And I think in terms of reimbursement for services, um, you know, we're doing some primary care clinics um, right now that we're piloting. And the whole goal of those is really to look at what services are being provided, um, you know, what's the effort involved with those services, and that will be used to help inform what we do reimburse under the tariff agreement. So absolutely, those are very good points, things that we are continuing to work on, and I'll be happy to chat with you a little bit more about it. And then I think four. No, you're good now? Okay. See, that's good. You hear somebody else's question. You don't have to. So did you still have? Okay. So do you have a Two comments. Basically, the first one was inspired by yours because you made the comment that you'd hire any doctor, and then you caught yourself that you'd say you hire almost any doctor. <laughs> In my experience, I ran into that, and we are because we're so desperate. We we are hiring nurses and doctors who have no business being nurses and doctors, mm -hmm. and that's a real problem. The other point that I want to make is just locally because we are outside of the citadel, and in a rural community that we're in, we are not facing a health care crisis. We are triaging our own health care because we are blessed with a volunteer fire department who is able to respond and make do with no ambulances available and actually transport a, a, a person to the hospital. We are dealing with an RCMP detachment who has to use their resources if they have a mental issue with a, price, a person who needs to see a psychiatrist that has to go to Yarmouth or has to go to Kenfo. That's taking an officer off the streets in the town and in this county to actually go and deal with that. So there's nothing been said tonight about those other responders, and that's really important that we, we show some respect to them because they're really stepping up to yeah. those two groups. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So um, you're right. We, we don't want any doctor or any nurse. Uh, I couldn't agree more, or any health care provider for that matter. And the colleges will tell you that they're, and it is, it is their primary role is to protect the public. And we have to, we have to, you know, that's what they're there for. They protect the public and they make sure I'm a registered nurse. And so they make sure that I follow my standards of practice and my code of ethics. And if I'm not there, I don't get to call myself a registered nurse anymore. So I, your point is taken. So we do want to streamline our processes but we don't want to lose the quality of the candidate, right? We need to be really aware of that. And there will be times that people will come with an international education, and for whatever the reason, they won't be able to work fully to the scope that maybe they were able to work at, you know, where they were educated in their home country. But that doesn't mean that they can't participate in our healthcare system at a different, in a different and, and meaningful way. So some physicians, as an example, may work as a clinical associate and have to work under the um, uh, purview of another physician, as one example. Or perhaps uh, somebody in, uh, trained in nursing may work as a CCA, LPN, depending, or perhaps a different type of healthcare worker in order to, to make sure that they can contribute, but maybe not to the degree that they did, um, you know, where they, where they came from. But the colleges are there to protect us. And to your point, um, Jeff is a gentleman sitting right behind you, and he works with EHS. He's, uh, he's the, uh, the regulator. Uh, Jeff and I and uh, Dr. Andrew Travers have been working with our medical first responders. We know that they specifically, particularly over COVID, uh, they've seen a difference in their calls. Sometimes they're called when they shouldn't be called, and sometimes they're not called when they should be called. So we're making a very conscious effort to go out and speak to the medical first responders, particularly our volunteer fire departments, to understand their experience and see where we can help. And so as an example, we hear about training. How do we support them in making sure that they have the training because their budgets are not very big? So we are having those conversations. And then the last thing I would say about RCMP, that's the second time actually that it's come up in another rural community. And so I appreciate you raising it here again tonight. Some of it will fit under um, you know, the, the, the rules. So there will be things that, that, uh, that you know, paramedics will need assistance with, people who have certain conditions, perhaps under the criminal code, those types of things. But we want to make sure we're using everybody in the rural community. So we have to dig into that issue a little bit. We heard about it on Friday. Was it Friday? And today's Monday, so we didn't get to it yet, but we will get to it because we want to understand what that needs to look like in order to support rural communities with their policing. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you. Hey, thank you. So back here. Gosh, all kinds of hands up now. Okay, so we'll go here and then here, here, and we'll... Try to get through everybody, so 
Mine is a bit of a comment. Um, I appreciate the fact that you are looking at the communication. I think that is a huge issue in this area, well, probably across the board. Um, it's really difficult to find, to easily find access, to access the system when you're not, when you don't know anything about it. I was a healthcare provider. I've come into the province and I find it really frustrating and really hard to find out where to get things. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm used to advocating for myself. So people who aren't used to advocating, you know, they must be totally, or, you know, give up basically because they can't um, get any of the information. Um, the information that's out there isn't necessarily correct. I just checked tonight. Soldiers Memorial Hospital says it's open 24 hours. Yet, that's when you first look at the website, it says open 24 hours. You go into the website and it says they're open from 7.30 to 1.30. So, you know, if I was expecting the Digby Hospital to be emergency to be closed, and I looked on the, in, you know, where am I going? Okay, I'll go to Soldiers. It, it would be a totally wasted trip. It could cost me my life, could cost somebody else, you know, issues. So communication and making communication a basic, simple communication is key for all of these, all, all of the problems that we've been going, we've been talking about is basically can be come down to communication. The other point I want to say is that I actually used that little mobile clinic in Weymouth. I was absolutely delighted with the care I got. It was, I would love it if they were there every three weeks or every four weeks. You know, we're working on it. You know, I think that would be a wonderful service. Again, communication. All I, I took probably, because I do have some complex medical issues, I probably took about 40 minutes Ex with all in you know talking to people, if my records had been online, mm -hmm. it would have been, you know, ten. Yeah. So, in a in the long term, it's really important to get that again communication between in all of the departments. I'm going to be using your quote when I go to talk to my colleagues at Treasury and Policy and Cabinet about all, why the, we need all of these, you know, these digital platforms, how essential they are to connect us and to make sure that things are speaking together. And we heard from clinicians again and again and again how important that is and what an essential recruitment and retention tool that that one patient, one record will be for us. So thank you very much. And those clinics um, really are a diamond. We hear again and again and again what a value they are and the people there are so energized, so thank you. I think it's important also to note that, um, you know, we tend to get caught up in the jargon, mm -hmm. which I, I don't even understand half of it. So if I don't understand it, then, you know, it doesn't, it, 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 it's not gonna resonate with people, so, so I just, that kind of, um, I, I know there are other questions, but it does segue to virtual care, which we did want to talk about for a few minutes. And the reason why I raise it at this point is because in the same way that communication can be a challenge, we also know certainly that, um, you know, signing up for virtual care, fooling around with that, getting your appointment and all of, all of the rigmarole can, can sometimes be a challenge too. So as was noted earlier, we do have a guru in the back, yes, who's, who's very good with all of these things, standing exactly, standing up in the back there, and has been religious in, in um, coming along on, on our speaking tour over the last number of weeks. But um, the point I was going to make is, is that we also know that certainly you know, some people don't have a computer, some people don't have the internet, some people don't, uh, you know, they, they just, this is not their world. Yet they're, they're on uh, the need a family practice list, so they are eligible for virtual care Nova Scotia. And so they're, so I'll just toss this back to the community. Um, there are two uh, spots in the province, certainly the Aberdeen Hospital Foundation, partnered with the library in New Glasgow to set up a virtual care 
kiosk that helps people to navigate and to actually go through their, to either set them up or to help them with their appointment. So this is a community service. Bear River does it here. And Bear River does it here, is exactly what I was going to say. And I think as well, they're doing it in Yarmouth. So, so if you thought that was something that would be worthwhile, I think uh, it's, it's worth thinking about to just provide a little bit of extra help to folks. And um, I can tell you right now, there's over 40,000 Nova Scotians on the virtual care. Uh, one of the tips I heard on this tour is if you go in and you find that all the appointments are taken, just take a step back and go back in again because it is highly unlikely that all of the appointments are taken in a given day. Am I right on that? Yes, I am. Okay, so sorry, I segued, but it just seemed to go with the communication element. So back to you. Question right up here. <laughs> to the mic runners. This, which, yeah, this guy, yeah. Yep. That's, on, that's on point. <laughs> Hi, thanks for coming. We really appreciate you coming here. And it looks like a good team that we have on our side. Um, I, I hear that we're short on doctors and nurses and we're trying to get them from Ontario and Quebec and everywhere else. But also they're short on staff. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to steal from Peter to pay Paul, which is, doesn't work. Doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> So I'm going to give you this folder here. It has six doctors who are willing to immigrate within the next 90 days to Canada, a PhD OR nurse, and two nurses. You do as you well with them, and this is my contribution to Digby. Thank you. He is a recruiter. He came to the meeting prepared. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, I love you. I love you. Tito. You're my man. This is a dynamic duo here. The, uh, Brian's next to him and uh, like the, talk about a can-do attitude, so we're going to keep in touch. Is there anything you want to talk That's about, Mr. Balser, about immigration? Is there anything that I you want to highlight? No. Yeah. yeah, just quickly. Yeah. Here, here, take a mic. Yeah, I, I just want to say that I have the privilege, of course, of, of being the Minister of Labor, Skills and Immigration, and I get to work with Minister Thompson on a regular basis. I just want everyone to know that, of course, our population, as Charlotte, you said, is growing, and we need to make sure that that growth is impacting all regions of the entire province. So just one thing that I want to share, because we have our friends here from Clara as well, we have to look at opportunities locally of where we can partner and work together to make sure that folks are looking at this region as an opportunity to be able to grow. So I actually had the opportunity to travel with my immigration team on my very first mission. It was in line with our Francophone action plan. So we made sure that we launched that plan in Claire first and then went overseas to Paris and France to talk to immigrants who were identified from the Embassy of Canada who want to come to Canada. So we were there, and to the point that's been made, it's a global competition out there. So what sets Nova Scotia apart from all the other provinces and all the other territories? So that's what we got to be able to see, is how do we sell Nova Scotian life that's there? For the folks that we spoke to, they speak French first. And so they said, we want to live in French-speaking communities. So what did I do? I said, well, you got to come to Claire, and then there's Digby, and then there's Yarmouth, and the Western Zone is amazing. We had Angelique LeBlanc there from the Western Wren, who was also passing out job offers as people were coming. So I just want folks to know, I'm champion as your MLA, this region, any opportunity that I have, but we have an incredible leadership team who also knows the importance of immigration and the importance of welcoming communities too. Because this area also has a history of being welcoming and that's what we need to do when more and more folks arrive from different parts of the world. So that's just what I want to be able to share because the trip was amazing. <laughs> Thank you. She sounds like a pretty good salesperson to me. Yeah, I know. I was thinking that too. We have someone, uh, sorry, I, I, I know. I really don't like the pointing thing, but I really don't know how else to do it. So um, I know you had a question. Um, I just want to start by saying that we have such a wonderful turnout here in Digby because we have been holding meetings around healthcare here for 10, 15, 20 years. Um, so healthcare has been a dire issue in the Digby area for a long time. So you have tonight talked a lot about transformation and transforming. I would strongly encourage you to consider decentralization, um, especially of pediatric care. Um, I have a child with epilepsy. Um, I have spent a considerable amount of time in ERs. I have traveled a lot. 
he has had four doctors, four different nurse practitioners, and he's on his fourth neurologist, and he's seven. Okay? That is what our retention is like in this area, and now I'm also seeing that the IWK has been affected. So my concerns are, what are we doing for people who can't drive their child to the IWK? What are we doing for people who can't navigate the system? And it's great to hire navigators, but maybe we need to simplify the system and we need to make it more accessible. And I think if we're talking about retention of people in this community, especially families, we need to have greater care for our children and accessible care for our children. Thank you. Yeah, so I think there's a couple of things. Certainly recruitment and, uh, you know, we want to make sure that the regional hospitals, one, have access to pediatric care. And also, uh, we are trialing, couple, like the virtual care, how do we leverage? So when you have a plan of care, if there is an incident at home, how can an emergency room physician or a primary care provider be in, a, in virtual contact with the specialty services? So we're looking at something called virtual hallway because sometimes you, you travel and it's a 10 minute appointment and it's a really long drive and not everybody has means or ha can miss work and all of the different things that are involved with having a chronic disease or someone you love with a chronic disease. So really looking at access, how do we leverage virtual care so that primary care providers can speak directly to the specialty services, whether that's at a regional hospital, from a rural hospital, or whether that's from, from here to you know, those more tertiary and, and quaternary care in, in, in Halifax. So we are looking at that. It's important. And um, through the Nova Scotia Innovation Hub as well, looking at physicians, we have a, a doctor, Dr. Karen Cross. She's amazing. She m created some kind of a device that, that really allows virtual assessment um, in limbs. She's a plastic surgeon. And what she's been able to do, the work that she's been able to kind of champion has really opened our eyes to what are some of the possibilities that technology and, and, and internet capacity can give us in order to get care to people in a timely manner. And that's wonderful, like for the diagnostic Yeah. Yes. Hospital. Okay. Yep. So it's just because we're not, it's that education piece and where we don't have specialists that either are in our area or visit our area. Yes. Um, if you only have access to ERs, again, people don't know your file, they don't know your yep. history. So it's always, in my son's case, it's a febrile seizure. It's a febrile seizure. Uh -huh. I had to demand that he be basically referred to the IWK. So with, oh, we need to bring them here. Th we need to bring people okay. here and our kids need deserve that care because they're as worthy of care as mm -hmm. people in the city. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we have a question. Did you still have a question or has it already been answered? Okay, good. <laughs> okay. And then I have here, and then we're getting close to time. So I know there's lots and lots of hands up. Yeah. Thank you for coming. I think I'm probably the oldest person here. So anyway, I'll just give, a, give you a quick history. I worked in the old hospital, also worked in the 90-bed hospital, which is a full-fledged hospital here in Digby. We had surgery, we had OBS, we had intensive care, we had everything. And now we have very little. And back then there was no, well, every now and then we'd have overcrowding, but not very often because we had these, what, we call, what you call cottage hospitals that had the uh, capacity to take the overflow and so forth. And um, so that's just a little history. The other thing is, have you looked at the Ukrainian refugees? I know some of them have medical backgrounds and they're nurses, they're lab techs, they're, they're everything. In fact, my daughter owns a business and she's hired a mechanic, okay? And I'm um, just wondering if you're gonna fast track them through the business through, through um, the medical system. The other thing is, the other question I have is, are you prepared to increase the doctor's salaries? Now I know in BC, they just increased their salaries. Hopefully that will not take any of our doctors we presently have here, but I think $40 for a visit to a doctor is very, very low. They are worth more than that. That's my question. 
Thanks. Um, so that's interesting history. It's uh, always good to take a look back, you know, and we learn from history too. So on the Ukrainians, we have, so yes, we're really looking into how we can bring some of these uh, Ukrainian healthcare uh, workers into our system here in Nova Scotia. So there are a number who immigrated to Nova Scotia. And uh, what we've done is we, we, we have a person on staff who speaks Ukrainian, which is helpful. So we have a newsletter that goes out to the Ukrainian community, uh, those who, who have come as a result of the um, most recent struggle, uh, as well as our other Ukrainians. We've, we know who, which healthcare workers are in the province. We've already landed two or three. One's working in Sydney as a clinical associate. One's working in, uh, in Colchester Hospital and his uh, wife, so those are two, two physicians. His wife is a lawyer. She's a navigator with the Ukrainian community. What we've said to the Ukrainian folks is, we want you in our system. We'll put, we'll put you in as high a level as we can get you to start while we ladder you to perhaps where your full scope is. So, so we're, we're definitely, we have our outreach and we send a letter, uh, newsletter every week to the folks on our survey. And just so you know, just to put it in perspective, about 1,300 healthcare workers uh, escaped from the Ukraine uh, over the past year. So they're not all in Nova Scotia. And so this newsletter doesn't just stay in Nova Scotia, it grows across the country. We have worked with the college, um, both physicians and nurses, to see if we can't you know, get, get some stuff going in an accelerated fashion. So I appreciate that question, and, and yes, it's on our radar screen. So thank you. Uh, and in regard to physician payment, we have been um, chatting with our colleagues in British Columbia about their new agreement there. British Columbia was a majority fee-for-service jurisdiction before this most recent agreement, and some of what they've moved to we do have as an option here in Nova Scotia, more of a co contract alternative payment plan, um, but we are looking at, at what they are doing there, and we are all, we, we're always looking at new ways of doing things. We do have a, a pilot that the minister had announced earlier in the year um, related to a, it's called a blended capitation model where you get paid based on you know how many people you have in your practice and then you also get a fee for service. So there are a number of different payment models that we have, not just fee for service, but whenever we negotiate with Doctors Nova Scotia on behalf of uh, physicians, that obvious compensation is always always on uh, for negotiation. And I know there are a lot of questions left. We have, it's five to nine, and I know this time went by really quickly. So, and now I feel like there's all this pressure because <laughs> I know you're probably gonna be the last question. And so no pressure on the last question, but I am gonna, so I think this is the last question, but I do wanna just make sure that everyone, I know there's still some hands up, like I know I saw some hands up around. Please write your question down on a card with your contact information, whether it's a phone number or an email, and someone will get back to you to answer your question. Or if you've submitted a question prior to, um, we have those questions and someone will follow up and I know that the follow-up happens. I, we hear it in other conversations that happen. So again, over to you for the final question. Thank you. Um, so to touch a little bit base on what this gentleman did and the other gentleman with the firefighters and being first responders, we do go in first and like he said, you know, we could be up to four hours and is there going to be any compensation fuel prices are rising and you know fire departments are not getting you know reimbursed for fuel or anything we're getting the blunt before the paramedics do and then the paramedics get it after we do um just wondering if there's Yep, so thank you for that question. Uh, volunteer fire departments are incredibly important to us, um, and, and certainly we've done some work. Um, just to highlight, you know, the, the grants went out to every volunteer. So there was $10,000 grants that went out um, in, for each of the volunteer fire department search and rescue. And we've also worked really hard to expand coverage through Minister Balser's department. Um, so cancer coverage went from six to 19 cancers, and also to cover firefighters um, 
if there's a cardiac event within 24 hours. So we're really proud of that. We know there's more work to do. And uh, as I said, w we are looking at that. We, um, Jeff, what's the name of the, is it the Nova Scotia Fire Association, Fire Association of Nova Scotia? So we've been working with them and also mutual aid. There's mutual aid down in Cape Breton and it seems like there's different representatives for each. So we have heard that repeatedly from the fire and also um, Minister Tory Rushton, uh, MLA John White. There's a number of firefighters I in our caucus who regularly bring our concerns. So I don't have anything to commit to you now, but I can tell you that we are discussing it and how best to support our volunteers. We are so appreciative of the work you do. It is volunteer. You have a number, like training, not only for MFR, but for fire response, and then emergency scene response. So very, very grateful, and we want to be supportive partners to you, because we do really appreciate you, and we need you. So yes, there will be ongoing conversations about that. Okay, and one quick thing. Is there any talk of, like, upgrading the potential for schooling to bring, like, MFRs onto, like, paramedic teams? and? Well, maybe you and I and Jeff, hands. maybe you and I and Jeff will curl up after this okay. and we'll, yeah, tell you a little bit about what's going on. All right. Yeah. <laughs> we'll solve all of the problems. A nurse next. with two lawyers, right? So they don't want to talk about curling yeah, up. No. That's, the last, <laughs> that's the last language they want to hear. Sorry. We'll discuss after. Yeah. Thank you. I will collaborate. Okay. Thank you very much for coming, everyone. I, I uh, whenever we do these sessions, and I know these guys hear it every time I say, I always, I'm, I, and I'm really blown away by the engagement. I know you said you've been having these community conversations around healthcare for a long time, but it is really great to see committed community members coming out, offering solutions and ideas and thoughts and resumes. Um, it really, it really speaks a lot to the community itself. And so, thank you all very much. And I always want to say thank you to the leadership team to come up who come up and face questions that they don't know they're going to get until they get here. And, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, I think it's courageous, and I'm really um, happy to be part of these conversations and glad to be here and glad to have all you here tonight. So with that, we will say good night. And remember, this is online. If you want to watch it later and <laughs> review it, that's great. And uh, safe travels tonight. Thanks. Thank you.